Good morning, everyone. I hope everything is well with you, despite the circumstances that we are in. Perhaps some of us are grieving for the loss of someone. Others are struggling with physical ailments, while others with unemployment. But even in these hard times, I'm thankful that God has given us another Sunday to fellowship online, worship Him together, and be reminded of His unfailing love for us and for calling us to be a light of this world. Which brings me to our scripture today, taken from Romans 12 verses 1 to 8, and it reads, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For us in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. But before we delve into Romans 12, bear with me as we travel a few decades back in time. If you are my age or older than me, then these images will be familiar to you. Bell-bottom pants, tight white collar and flowery long sleeves were once the fad of society. And who can remember this dance in 1977? That was John Travolta's Saturday Night Fever under the beat of the Bee Gees. You see, during this period, I spent part of my childhood in a farm. And with the kind of fashion then, I could recognize my brothers even more than one kilometer away because of those bell-bottom pants hitting and sweeping the ground as they walk, leaving a big trail of dust after them. And when rural folks have a dance night or a baile, sometimes referred to as discoral by the Cebuanos, you can just imagine how much dust is generated when people started to dance staying alive of the Bee Gees. If you're asthmatic, you will probably have hard time staying alive. Funny, but it demonstrates an Im impulse we find all over in human society. We call it conformity. This conformity appears in places as harmless as fashion trends, but sometimes it can also be dark. Think of the young Chinese people almost a century ago, dressed as Mao Zedong, or the fierce and recognizable Nazi party emulated by the Hitler youth. Such ideology came with a uniform. The view then is you should be in with the crowd. And do you know the number one enemy in this kind of situations? Diversity. If you're diverse or different from the rest, you probably end up in prison or the gas chamber. In the book of Romans, one of the few themes that rings out over and over is the theme on unity. Why is this so? It is because the Jewish Christians and the Gentile believers are at odds with each other. Note that the Roman church was founded decades before Paul wrote the letter, and believers had been living and working as a Christian community. But a few years before this letter was written, Emperor Claudius kicked all the Jews out of Rome. As a result, 
the church there became exclusively Greek and Roman believers. However, five years later, the Jews were allowed to return only to find themselves in conflict with the Gentile believers. Jewish and Gentiles have extremely different backgrounds. Faith played a different role in their cultures. And for centuries, their respective communities have defined themselves against each other. It's no surprise that unity is a major theme for Paul throughout his letter. My brothers and sisters, we in the church is one family in Christ. We gather around with one set of beliefs and behavior. And all these cultural divisions of the past and the differences due to tribal ancestry or race, educational background, status in society, gender, age, and or skills are supposed to be no longer relevant. It's an ideal condition of a church. But sadly, it's an ideal the church has been trying to live up for 2,000 years with only partial success. Paul describes his vision of the body of Christ in verses 4 to 5 of Romans 12. We have many parts in the one body, and all these parts have different functions. In the same way, though we are many, we are one body in union with Christ, and we are all joined to each other as different parts of one body. In a relatively small persecuted community, like the church in Rome, conformity was one of the ways that keeps them together, one that bonds and held them as a unit. Actually, this is how we felt as a church decades ago. Conformity to circumcision, Sabbath keeping, festivals, dietary laws, and other cultural practices that had nothing to do with being in Christ. We felt so special and unique because we're the only chosen people going to the place of safety, while the rest of humanity will be doomed in the last days. And somehow, we felt bonded by it. But Paul is saying that the gospel that is Jesus Christ is stronger and more durable than conformity. What Paul wrote cuts against the tensions that were going on in the church. Paul calls us to appreciate a diversity of callings and expressions within the body of Christ, to accept ourselves and others, and appreciate the differing voices in the church, even depending, trusting, leaning on the diversity of gifts each one of us possess as provided by God. Yes, depending and helping each other, that's what makes a healthy church. The idea of working, sharing, and worshiping together in unity amidst cultural diversity during Paul's time is revolutionary. During this period, slaves don't eat with their masters. They are treated as possessions. Beliefs varied so much among the population. The Macedonians have their gods, so does the Romans, the Greeks, the Jews, and other nationalities. Others even worship Caesar. So to see people from these diverse backgrounds to sit and share a meal together, listen to Paul, and worship God together is mind-boggling. To make a local analogy, it's just like having a church service in Spratly's Island, attended by some Chinese Navy personnel, Philippine Marines, maybe some Vietnamese soldiers from neighboring island, Pinoy fresher pox, young ones, leaders of various political affiliations, Liberal Party, PDP Laban, and Hugpong ng Pagbabago parties, and local community folks, listening to a sermon by Pastor Guzon on how Jesus Christ died for all of them, then share lunch together, and then fellowship before saying goodbyes to each other. Such scenario would probably make a headline. Because even at this time, it is revolutionary. In Paul's time, he asked the believers in Rome to give up all the division and to meet in these small diverse communities as an outpost of the new humanity in Christ. The new humanity that didn't fall into conformity or old cultural divisions. This is painted by Paul as one body 
of Christ. The metaphor of a body in which all the parts not only appreciate each other, but depend on each other, is common in Paul's writings. It illustrates a complex relationship that can only be held together by what we call love. History shows that we human beings are simply not capable of allowing diversity in a relationship. The maltreatment and death of George Floyd that prompted protests in the U.S. and around the world is just an example among many of how incapable we are in accepting diversity despite all our lip service of equality. By ourselves, we just can't sustain it. We need some supernatural help. And this can only be done by becoming part of the body of Christ, different from each other, but held together by His love. C.S. Lewis drew the analogy between Christ and the salt in our food. He wrote, If someone had salt for the first time, and we told them we use it in most of our cooking, they might assume that everything tastes the same. But salt only brings out the flavor of the steak, potatoes, cabbage, or whatever we put it into. That the diversity of it is magnified and celebrated by the salt. The uniqueness of each dish is brought out by the salt, just as the unique makeup of each person is accentuated and brought to life by Christ. This is one of the revolutionary ideas that Paul puts forward. In verses 6 to 8 of Romans 12, We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. The point is we're all different. Even people that have the same passions are different. We're not created with the same talents. We have different gifts. So there's no point of comparing. We even differ in our degree of understanding. We differ in our preferences, our likes, dislikes, so much so that we even have our own divisions, whether to be modern in our worship or to be along the more traditional expressions. In some areas, hymnal thumpers look down their noses at lively PowerPoint praisers as non-serious and self-focused. PowerPointer enthusiasts look at traditionalist preachers with contempt as boring and obsolete. In this time of pandemic, others prefer online services while others want to restore church services in their respective areas. You know, these divisions may be small, sometimes even silly, but even the small cracks or fissures can become fault lines in the Christian community. Paul reminded us that we are one body in Christ and it's only through Him that we can have lasting unity in diversity. Without Christ in our individual lives, diversity will always pose a friction in our relationships. The second revolutionary idea discussed by Paul here and elsewhere in Romans is even more uncomfortable than embarrassing as the bell-bottom styles in the 70s and 80s. And this is about sex. One of the most talked about topics in human history. Everybody has an opinion in it, maybe two or more. Wars are even fought over sex, and every other generation is convinced they have a good understanding of it. We may wonder why Paul talk about it so much. Sexual relationships and issues come up dozens of times in his letters. And it's interesting how the church is uncomfortable talking about the topic, even in our respective families. But it was a revolutionary marker of what it meant to be God's people at that time, especially in Rome. You see, Roman wives were expected to observe absolute monogamy to one husband throughout their whole lives. 
On the other hand, Roman men were completely the opposite. Recreational sex was the cultural norm. Regular, upstanding Roman citizens went to prostitutes, often at the religious temples, and routinely used their slaves, men and women, for what one ancient writer called everyday urges. Sex with their wives was important because it was connected to childbirth. But most of the time, erotic encounters for men were just an appetite like eating and drinking. For Paul to call the Roman men believers to sexual purity was absolutely revolutionary. Such command as part of their new moral code in Christ would have been completely disorienting. It was progressive, disruptive, and most surprisingly to our modern ears, deeply feminist. But it makes sense. Why? If we live in a society where there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, then we should all have the same sanctified ethics. Instead of the pervading understanding of our body as our own property, which we could use as we wanted, Paul asked the Roman believers to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. We are not our own anymore, nor are we slaves of our insatiable desires. Our body is no longer just an afterthought that is connected with our spirit and can be used how we see fit. Our soul, mind, and body belong to the Lord. This is what Paul is trying to say. In today's society, nearly complete sexual license is common. Books, TV shows, movies, news, and even regular conversations among unbelievers at school and at work are promoting or supporting sexual license, promiscuity on the level of Roman society and our present society causes innumerable problems like exploitation, corrosive relationships, and addiction, just to name a few. Destroying families and numerous lives of men and women, and most especially children. Even in today's society, the Christian commitment to sex within marriage is still revolutionary. A revolution of healed relationships, of women not living in fear of exploitation, and celebration of God's great gift of physical love, rightly enjoyed. This should be the order of the day among the people of God. My brothers and sisters, these revolutionary ideas of unity in diversity and sexual purity put forward by Paul back in Rome are still as important and relevant today. For such revolutionary ideas defines and sets us apart as God's people, members of the body of Christ and light of this world. May the love of the triune God live in us, make us pure, and unify us into the body of Christ. Let us now proceed to the communion ceremony. This reminds us again that of all the sacrifices ever offered by men to God, only the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is honored by Him as the ultimate payment of man's sins. It rendered the temple irrelevant and no further sacrifice is ever needed. Luke 22 verses 19 to 20 describes this event. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let us pray. Lord, Thank you for the body and blood of Jesus Christ, symbolized by this bread and wine, sacrificed at the cross that we may have unrestricted access to your throne. The sufficiency of your son's sacrifice unshackles us of the burden of sin. 
removing our fear of our own sins and the need to trust in our own righteousness. Because through Him and by Him, we are made righteous. For your unfailing love and ultimate sacrifice, we give our utmost gratitude and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the bread of life, the body of Jesus Christ, we remember. The wine, the blood of Jesus that made our redemption possible, we remember. Thank you for joining and staying with us. May you have a blessed Sunday and a fruitful week ahead. Please stay safe.